Camille Fournier, welcome to The Work Item. I am so excited that you're here. And before we get to the show, uh, tell us more about what you are working on uh, these days. A financial company in New York City uh, called Two Sigma. Um, so that's my, my focus these days is really back to infrastructure software and uh, you know managing large teams and being part of an engineering leadership group. And you know I'm having fun with it. You've had a pretty extensive career. Uh, you've worked at Microsoft. You've been a VP at Goldman Sachs. You were the CTO at Rent the Runway. Uh, these seem like very different organizations. So they do a lot of things quite differently. You know, if I even compare Microsoft to Goldman Sachs, which is, which is a financial organization, how are they different in terms of the work that you've done? Because you've been doing deep engineering work in each and every one of them. And one of the fun facts is you work on .NET CLR. Is that correct? It was a very long time ago, yes. <laughs> right. So they're vastly different projects. How did that work in your experience and how did that span? Let's see. So I guess, look, at Microsoft, I was right out of undergraduate. So, you know, I was still learning how to be an employee. I was still learning how to, uh, you know, how to, how to like work, really. Um and, you know, I joined this team because I thought I was really interested in, you know, compilers and runtimes. And I have to admit, it was a it was an intensive job. Um, and I, you know, I kind of didn't really know how to work at that point. I mean, I had done some internships in college, but I just like didn't exactly know what I was doing. Um, so, you know, I, it was like a year and a half of like working with really, really smart people but feeling a little bit like I had no idea what I was doing and I had no idea like how to be productive. And this was like right when .NET was very first launching. So everybody on the team for the first several months I was there was like just in super crunch mode. They did not have time to be onboarding a brand new college hire. Um, and, you know, I didn't really know how to like jump into these massive code bases and really figure out my way around. So I kind of tell people, you know, I learned some things in that first, you know, couple of years of work, but not as much as I as I probably should have or could have because I just didn't really I didn't know how to like approach it and I wasn't in an environment that was really set up for like somebody who needed you know, frankly the kind of handholding that I guess I did at that point in my life. Um so I went to graduate school for a couple of years um and decided I didn't want to get a PhD. <laughs> so I then went to Goldman Sachs. Um and I went to Goldman Sachs because I wanted to live in New York City. Um, and Goldman was, you know, willing to pay me enough money to live in New York City, which is what I wanted. And it, look, it seemed like an interesting group. It was working in their risk technology area. I liked all the people. They seemed nice. Um, they seemed smart. Um, and I actually ended up having an amazing experience at Goldman. Um, I was there for about six and a half years. And so I did a few different things in my time there. But you know, the difference between Microsoft and Goldman for me was that, you know, I came when I came to Goldman, they were doing kind of a proto agile style of development called extreme programming, which maybe some of your listeners have heard of and many probably haven't. But, you know, it was early agile. It was test driven development, um, you know, and and a lot of like much more frequent software releases than many people were doing at the time. Um, and that was pretty awesome because. I could actually figure out how to like make myself productive because we had all these tests that were kind of like the way you found your way into the code base. And so in addition to doing some pair programming to kind of get me started, there was all these tests and I all of a sudden started to feel like I could figure out my way around this code base. I could become productive. Um, and, you know, that really like gave me the, the depth and the time I needed to really become a great software engineer, a great programmer, you know, just feel confident learn the skills that I needed to learn. I got to work on a bunch of big distributed systems in my time in that risk team and, and beyond. Um, and I was at Goldman, like I said, for about six and a half years, um, mostly doing, you know, kind of big tech systems. Um, so, you know, I worked on the Apache Zookeeper project and a, and a project related to that as kind of my last thing there. And that was really awesome um, because, you know, just really interesting distributed systems problems and, you know, consensus problems there. Um, when I left Goldman to go to Rent the Runway, I had kind of, you know, I got into a pretty senior level as an individual contributor. So I was like a sort of a staff engineer type person. Um, and that 
was cool and I felt good. I felt good about my skills. I felt like I had learned a lot, but I kind of wanted to grow more and become, I, I wanted to kind of try out managing and managing larger teams and, and getting more leadership experience. And Goldman was a really big company. And, you know, the way you ended up getting into management, you know, it just it involved a lot of trade-offs that I didn't want to make, frankly, right? Like maybe you could become a manager, but like most of your team would be in India. And so you would always be awake, like super early in the morning or super late at night because of the time zone shift. And I was like, not really excited about that. Or, you know, maybe you would go manage, you know, a team that was working on something that you're just super uninterested in, right? And, you know, that's okay. You know, in retrospect, I'm like, that's totally reasonable to make these kinds of trade-offs, but I just didn't want to make them. Um, and I also thought that the startup industry seemed fun. And I was like, look, like this is the time in my life. I feel like I'm a really confident engineer. I want to stretch myself. I want to try out this startup thing. So I left Goldman and I went to Rent the Runway. Um, and I really stretched myself because I ended up going there to manage to be a direct, director of infrastructure engineering. Um, I ended up becoming the VP of engineering, the SVP of engineering, the CTO. I ended up basically taking over the tech team about a year in um, and growing it and growing myself. and just like learning, you know, probably 15 years of management and life experience in about four years time, which was really exhausting. Um, so those, I, that's like a, kind of like the big transitions in my career. I left Rent the Runway after about four years because I felt like I had learned a lot and like kind of done what I set out to do, which was come in, stabilize the technology, grown the team, made the challenges of the company less about the technology and more about like other aspects of the business, which I felt good about. Right. Um, and I wanted to do something else. I wasn't sure what, so I actually took about a year and a half off and did a lot of random things, including writing the manager's path, teaching classes on engineering management, trying to become a founder and failing a, a few different times. Um, and then eventually I found myself, uh, at my current, current job because I, I decided I wanted to, you know, go back into sort of more standard engineering leadership at, a company that was bigger than a startup, but smaller than a big tech company. And so here I am. So it seems like the theme that I hear is doing things that are out of your immediate comfort zone. Is that the right way to put it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I get bored, I guess. And, you know, and I, and I try to, I, I want to be challenged, but I guess not so challenged that I feel like I'm paralyzed. Right. I think my, you know, my job at Microsoft was probably, too challenging, right? I was I was paralyzed. I didn't really know how to like ask for help or get better at my job. And so I, I kind of didn't, right? And and I, I sort of gave up in that situation. And I think what I've learned over time is like I need to find something there where I feel like I'm challenged and I'm growing and I'm, you know, experiencing different things, but maybe like where I can also still be successful. Uh and it's not I'm not totally in over my head. So if I remember correctly, you had a previous conversation where you mentioned that at some point you doubted if you wanted to be in tech. What was that about? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so as I said, right, I, uh, I, I had the Microsoft job and it wasn't, you know, I, again, it wasn't a total waste, but I just didn't feel like I was, I was the person that I wanted to be. I wasn't like super productive and like, you know, this brilliant engineer. And then I went to graduate school. Um, and I, I was like an okay graduate student, but not a great graduate student, right? I, I was definitely not anywhere like top of my class. It wasn't easy. I wasn't a natural researcher. Um, and I think that, you know, after those two experiences, I was, I was just starting to wonder whether tech was the right thing for me. And this is sort of funny because like, I obviously enjoyed it enough to get an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree. Like I did like tech. I found it was, I found it interesting. But I just didn't feel like I was good at it. You know, I just didn't feel like I was like productive or, um, you know, like, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an overachiever. Right? Like I wanted to feel like I could be an overachiever. And I just wasn't ever getting that feeling in all of these experiences. Um, and so I actually did consider when I was leaving graduate school, I actually thought about going to law school. But I said, you know what, I'm not going to like jump straight from like a career that look, you can get a job that pays you enough money to live in New York City, you know, with very little experience. Um, I'm not going to jump from that to like going into massive law school debt without at least giving it a chance, one more chance. And I'm really glad that I gave it that last chance because I think, again, what I discovered was I just needed to find a place where I would be able to be productive. Um, but 
you know, it, it was definitely, I, I definitely had my doubts, right? Because I was looking at all these people that seemed like they knew what they were doing and they were so productive and they just like knew how to write reams and reams of code. And I clearly knew how to write code. But, you know, what if I could never figure out how to actually like do that day in and day out in a job? You know, I, I really had a crisis of faith. So was there a point where essentially it just clicked back and you said, oh, actually, never mind. It is tech. Tech, I like. Yeah, I mean, I really do think that like when I got to Goldman and, you know, I was put into this situation where I felt like I was getting the kind of help I needed, the kind of mentorship I needed. I was in a code base where I could actually figure out what was going on. Um, one one key thing that I did was because I went into finance and I knew nothing about finance in that job, um, I gave myself permission to ask really dumb questions, which I hadn't felt open to do in you know, really in any of my schooling or in previous jobs. And I think, you know, the tech um, culture sometimes can be a little bit harsh on people. You know, it's like, oh, you don't know that thing that, of course, everybody knows this. And even I do this to people sometimes, and I try not to do it anymore because it's kind of like, you know, it just makes people feel dumb and afraid to ask questions. And it's just not really very healthy. Um, And so when I went to this finance job, I was like, well, Nobody can possibly expect me to know anything about finance. I've taken no finance classes. I didn't even know what Goldman Sachs was before I came to work here. Like, I know nothing about this. Um, That actually kind of just that willingness to ask dumb questions. And anytime I was stuck, not letting myself stay stuck and then feeling kind of ashamed for being stuck, but instead of just like getting up and asking for help, uh, that I think really like broke things open for me a lot. So it's interesting because... It's the opposite of what a lot of people assume what comes with, you know, a job in tech where you're expected to kind of know everything and you're taking the opposite approach of saying, actually, I will learn with all of you, which again is very, I I talked to some folks that are very early in their career and to them, it's very discouraging because they feel like, well, I don't know a lot of these things that a lot of people are talking about. And reality is like, yeah, those people don't know either. They're figuring it out as they go. (laughs) So, (laughs) but I actually want to ask you about pair programming. And you mentioned that that you were uh, doing it at Goldman Sachs. And this is something that I've talked to one of my former colleagues, Chad Fowler, who's a uh, big in Ruby community. And he did the same thing. He used to do a lot of pair programming. I'm curious, how did that work out today? Because this is, again, a non-traditional side of engineering today. You don't hear a lot of people doing extreme programming nowadays. Yeah, and look, uh, even... Even when I was there, it wasn't like we did pair programming 24-7, right? We, you know, it was used to onboard people. And then, you know, you used it when you had something that you were really stuck on, you know, uh, or if you had something where you just like, you really needed to like power through something hard. So my experience with power with pair programming is it's really good for onboarding people, right? So like sitting next to someone who's learning, giving them the keyboard um, sometimes taking it yourself so they can watch you work. Right. But like really being forced to talk through things and having that, that shared focused attention, I think is very, very good for onboarding. It's great when you have like a weird bug and you're like both just like staring, you have the same context in front of you. So, you know, you're, you know, you're looking at the same things and you can, you know, you can maybe see what the other person is missing and vice versa. Um, and then I think it's really, it can be good because also when you're working with someone and you're kind of watching each other, you know, frankly, it just keeps you focused and on track, right? Like you can't be like, uh, I'm just going to go check Twitter for 30 minutes. And like, no, like you really actually have to be focused. And that's why I think it's like best to use lightly. Like I know some people do it day in and day out. I think that would be really exhausting personally. Like I just, you know, it is, it's a lot of work to do pair programming. Um, it's a lot of intense focus time, but it can be really productive in certain circumstances. And, you know, so I, I think it's like a, something everyone should do occasionally, but probably not not anywhere near every day. I have that sense when you're an engineer and somebody's watching over your shoulder for every single keystroke that you have. It's a little bit uneasy. It's just like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you do definitely have to trust the person you're doing pair programming with, too. Right. Like if you're if you were pairing with someone, I mean, you know obviously when you're onboarding, you're still getting to know people, but like if you're pairing with someone and you feel like they're just looking for you to make a mistake, what a, oof, that sounds horrible, right? It has to be a good trusting relationship. Right. Which takes some time to develop, but given the breadth of the experiences that you have across these different teams and different companies, have you established some kind of litmus test for you personally of saying which team you want to join? 
because there's the aspect of folks getting bored or maybe they feel like the project has hit kind of a dead end. But for you personally, what's that bar of saying, I will join this team versus I will not join this team? So I think there's a few things. Um, when it comes, so there has to be a level of like, I actually kind of believe that the thing they're trying to do can be successful. So, you know, when I, like I joined Rent the Runway, right? Rent the Runway is a women's uh, fashion startup here in New York City, right? They rent you know, designer dresses and accessories. And it's still going, it's doing very well, been a very successful company. Um, but when I joined, it was still very early. Um, and, you know, uh, it's not a tech startup and in, in, in the sort of traditional, like everything about it is, you know, it was selling a SaaS product or whatever, right? Um, but it was very clear to me that this was a great business idea. Um, that this, and that this was a great business idea that other people weren't going to, uh, value as highly as I would, because frankly, a lot of people in tech are men who don't necessarily think that like women's fashion is an interesting thing, even though I think it's a very interesting thing. And I actually think it's a huge market. Um, and so when I, you know, one of the reasons that I joined Rent the Runway was that I felt like, you know, it was a great business. And, and I do think that's something that I think about a lot when I pick companies to join is like, do I think that this, you know, do I think that this business is, um, you know, something that I'm going to be okay with having in my resume, right? And look, I joined Goldman Sachs has had its ups and downs as as a company in the sort of public eye. I joined long before the days when it was like the villain of Wall Street. Um, and I don't know if I would have joined after it became the villain of Wall Street, but, you know, I, I worked there, I worked there through that time. And I know the insider story and it's, you know, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but so I think for me, like, you know, it can't just be a good business because there are plenty of good businesses that it's like, I don't, you know, I'm not really interested in being involved in that thing that I think is bad for society. Um, you know, but I, I do have to feel like there's some, there's some kind of like interesting business proposition there. And then when it, in the, even when it comes to a team, right, I want to feel like the team is going to be able to be successful, that I can maybe make it more successful, but that it isn't sort of a foundationally hopeless thing, right? Um, you know, sometimes you just look at a team and you're, you know, you're like, their customers are unreasonable, they're understaffed, and they will never be staffed the way they need to be because of what I know about this company. And this is just going to be a punishing slog with very little upside potential. Some people like that. I think some people are, uh, uh, frankly, like kind of like to martyr themselves on maybe impossible causes, and sometimes they create magical things. Um, but I, I prefer something that I feel like is challenging and interesting. And in a technical area that I find intellectually interesting, but also that I also feel is likely to be able to be successful. <laughs> so in that regard, did you ever have any hesitation about joining a non-tech company? Because I feel like when you talk to engineers on their you know, list of companies to join, they always think of the FANG companies where, you know, I will jump from Netflix to Facebook to Microsoft to Amazon. But you went, again, you picked a very uh, unique path in that you decided to go to a non-tech company, which is feels like can be a gamble, right? Because you don't know what their tech stack is like or how focused they are on tech. How was that? Yeah, you know, um, I I don't mind working. F there, there are definitely like pros and cons to working for non-tech companies. Um, I do think that non-tech companies... Uh, you have to be interested in the business or you're probably not going to have a great experience. Um, and, you know, so I, I do think there needs to be a level of like, look, if you're really not interested in the business at all, you are probably going to hit hit a ceiling at some point with a non-tech company, even though there are plenty of technical challenges at, at non-pure tech companies. Uh, and, you know, these days it's like, what is a tech company? Is Airbnb a tech company? Yes, no, maybe, sort of, right? Like, you know, obviously, yes, there's lots of technical challenges there, but they're not, you know, renting, you know, renting out houses and, and, and places for, you know, vacations is not exactly a perfect match to a tech problem, right? So there, there are plenty of companies out there that are sort of tech companies or sort of not tech companies. Are you interested in the business? Because that's going to be a big area of learning for you. Um, and then I think, you know, can you differentiate yourself as well, right? So, I do think that tech companies, the downside, particularly of the big ones, is that it can be very hard to differentiate yourself in big tech companies. 
um, you know, it, particularly early in your career, you know, it's very easy if you go to a really big tech company, to just be like a cog in the machine. Um, and maybe you grow and you learn, you can learn a bunch. So you can learn a bunch from really smart people. And that's a huge upside to any big company. Um, but the downside is you're one of many, you know, and so you're, it's going to be a lot harder to distinguish yourself. Probably your career growth may be slower. It depends on the company. Um, and there, you know, there are pluses and minuses there. Right. Um, so I, I definitely think, look, I don't mind working for non-tech companies as long as I'm interested in the business. Um, I like the people, you know, uh, and I and I feel like I'm going to get some career growth and uh, out of the experience, right? I also happen to live in New York City, and I'm very happily in New York City, and that does also play a role for me, right? Like, you know, if I lived in the Bay Area, I probably would have worked for one of the big tech companies again, perhaps at some point. And all of those companies have offices here in New York, but it's not the same as being in HQ. And, you know, that's just a reality, particularly at my career level. Do you see that it's different nowadays when we're all going remote more or less? Like, is this an equalizer in terms of engineering careers or is it not really? I think we don't know yet. Um, you know, it could be, uh, I'm not holding my breath. Like I do, I do think that at the end of the day for most companies, particularly at the senior levels, people want to see your face. You want to, you know, people build connections person, you know, in person, um, you know, it's really hard to build the same level of connection in a purely remote setting. And so even if um, it's easier to have a, a better career, you know, not being in the, the HQ area, you're probably still going to be flying out there a lot to have that face time with people. And so, but I don't know, you know, like I could be very wrong. And I think we'll, we'll only know that in a few years. Right. And it totally makes sense. I hear this concept of the invisible barrier, where if you're remote versus somebody that rubs shoulders with the management, with their peers in the office, the relationship is going to be different, no matter how much effort you put into it, because you're not there in person. But yeah. Uh, it, it's an interesting phenomenon that I'm, I'm excited to see how it pans out. I am. How do you feel about remote work personally? If I ask you, like, because you, again, you are a very senior engineer, and as a senior engineer, how do you feel about being remote versus in the office personally? So I hate remote work. <laughs> I, I will admit, um, for me personally, right? So like, look, I'm a senior manager. I have an office with a door that shuts because all I do is sit in meetings all day, every day. Um, when you when all you do is sit in meetings all day every day, having to do all those meetings virtually is terrible. Um, I, I just like it's just it's not the same. It's a really kind of draining and stressful experience. And I think it's very different than if you're writing a code every day, right? Uh, you know, I think that as a you know when I was writing code every day, if I had been you know working from home or working from the office made not no difference, but maybe less difference. Right. Um, but I personally just like, I like, I like having a place away from my house to work. I like the commute. I like, you know, running into people in the office. Um, I just, I like having that separation of life and work. Um, and I find it really hard to do in a remote setting. And, you know, this is really just like my own personality. Like I think plenty of people are super productive. I don't think remote work is like a bad thing. I think it will be a bad thing if everyone's forced into it. Like I, I do think, I do think that that if all work becomes remote work in the future, there are a lot of downsides to it that I, I that folks don't necessarily, um, you know, don't necessarily think about as much. Uh, you know, like I don't want to give up a room of my house to being a full time office, and you kind of have to do that, or you have to have some co working place and coffee shop that you're going and look, if your job was like mine and you're in meetings all day, every day, it just doesn't really work very well from a coffee shop. So how are you going to make that work? So, you know, again, I, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of it personally, but that's not to say that it doesn't have a good place in the future of, of work in general. So speaking of careers, when I talk to folks that are, again, early in their career or mid-career, they talk about this concept of optimization of your own career track. And in your book, The Manager's Path, you talk about these different types of engineering careers. So when you start as an individual contributor, you go to tech lead, manager, VP, CTO. Do you see careers in the engineering track 
as being linear. It's like you have to hit each step or is it something that is a little bit more, I want to say like a, like a zigzag where you can just jump between depending on the opportunity. How do you see that? Yeah, I definitely don't think it's, it's linear. Um, I think it's lin it can be linear for some people it is linear. Um, but I know a lot of people who have switched back and forth between IC and management, for example, I actually did that a little bit. So when I was at Goldman, I had a period of time when I was managing a small team and then I went back to being an IC and that was fine. That was good. Really. Um, it was good for me. I learned something in the process of managing a small team for, you know, a year or so. Um, but I, you know, I also was like, this is not really what I want to be doing right now. I really want to be super focused on, you know, writing code and building systems. And that's where I am right now with my career. Um, and so I kind of bounced back and forth. Um, you know, I definitely think also that like, look, like, you know, your level, like whatever your quote unquote title is or level is, is not necessarily like a linear path either, right? You know, I'm not the CTO of my current company. I don't want that job, by the way. I have been a CTO. Maybe someday I will want to be a CTO again. But being a CTO is a really hard job. And uh, it is not necessarily the job that you want to do for your whole life once you've done it once, right? And I think if everybody who's ever been, you know, title X at, at you know, and won't ever kind of, go down a, t a title level for an opportunity that they find interesting. Look, there are pros and cons to that. Um, and, you know, certainly different, you know, different backgrounds are, are impacted differently by, you know, uh, whether their, their history is respect or not, right? Like if you are, you know, it, frankly, as a woman in tech, right, uh, it's a risk for me to take a lower title because like, am I going to ever be given the chance to get to those higher titles? But for me, personally, perfectly happy to not be a CTO right now. I think taking a step back and saying, I don't need the rest of my career to be, you know, CTO or bigger C-level titles. Um, because actually, like I learned a lot. I did that. Now I kind of want to go back and I still want to be a manager and I still want to be in leadership, but I want to be maybe focused on something that I find really technically interesting. And so I do think that, you know, very few people have perfectly linear careers. I think a lot of people have linear careers and then they just get to some level and they stay there for most of their career and they're perfectly happy. There is nothing wrong with that, right? You want to be a staff engineer at a big tech company and you love what you're working on and you want to do that for 20 or 30 years. Great. Like, you know, that, that's, that's fine. There's nothing that does not make you a bad person. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Similarly, you want to try management and realize that you hate it and go back to being an IC. Fine. That's actually that shows a lot of wisdom. Um, you know, so I don't think your career has to be linear at all or even necessarily should be. It's interesting that you mentioned the jump from IC to management and then back to IC, because, again, the misconception that I hear frequently is that folks see it as a demotion, that you went from IC to a manager and now you're back to an IC again. What went wrong? Right. Which is. Not really the case in what you're describing. You can just go to back to IC because management is not your thing and you're not as effective at it. I, I mean, you know, look, like as someone with a lot of uh, with a lot of insight and exposure into things like compensation, the uh, you know, ICs don't get paid less than managers, <laughs> right? At least not at, you know, most big companies. Um, ICs, the IC career path tends to be a little bit less clear cut because you know, when you're a manager, you're frankly like your career path tends to look like how many people are you managing? You know, how big is the team relative to the size of the company, et cetera, et cetera. It's not quite that simple, but often it can boil down to that. As an IC, it's a little bit less clear, right? You know, it's, you, you know, okay, like I built this big system and I learned how to influence these people and I learned how to like, you know, run this massive cross team project effectively. And like, these are kind of the kind of skills that get you raised up in levels and it's it's not nearly as um as clear cut as management can be but the idea that ICs are like less valued less lower compensated any of those kinds of ideas less powerful is is i think something that's just like a really common misconception because it's for the most part not it's certainly not like totally true it's often not true at all um you know except at the maybe the very senior most levels of a company. So in that context, is there any value in 
setting your sights on leadership roles, even if you're not necessarily having kind of big aspirations to be a VP of engineering or CTO of just saying, you know what, I should go into management, even though I might be just a, you know, engineer two or whichever bar you are at the company, but just pushing yourself into that management. Is, is there value in that? Well, I mean, look, I think that if you, uh, if you care about people and, uh, you know, you like thinking about how you can make groups of people work better together, make better decisions, um, you know, you, you're, you're interested in sort of organizational, the organizational side of leadership. If you're really interested in processes that make engineers more effective, um, you know, you really like interviewing and hiring and recruiting and, and all kinds of things like that. that. There's nothing wrong with becoming a manager. And in fact, you know, um, even if you, as you said, like you don't, maybe you don't ever want to be, you know, a senior executive or a CTO or whatever, you know, in some cases, being a line manager is a great job um, because, you know, you are still close enough to the technology that you can know a lot about it. You can know a lot about it. You can have informed opinions about it. Um, you can maybe even write a little bit of code, depending on how big your team is. Um, but you're, you know, you you also get to scratch that itch of like helping a group of people, you know, work well together and, you know, seeing through large initiatives and things like that. And, you know, that can be great if that if you think that that will make you happy. What I what I definitely discourage people from doing is you know, going into management simply because they want to have a lot of power over other people and they want to make all of the decisions and they want to be able to tell people what to do because, you know, there's much less of that than you actually think you're going to get. Um, and, you know, that's that that just tends to go poorly for everyone, yourself, your employees. And, you know, it's just a really bad reason to become a manager. Should folks think about progression in terms of title, because that's another thing that you often hear in terms of career progression is I want to become a CTO, but they're still a junior engineer, but they're kind of setting their sights high. Is that a good thing? Or is that generally a recipe for early failure because you have a long way to go? I mean, I, it's, you know, it's funny because of course I've met like plenty of, um, you know, young people who want to be CTO someday. And I do think it's a little bit I mean, it's a little bit naive because you have no idea what that job is. Um, and I actually think that most people, if they knew what it meant to be a good CTO, would not want the job because it's not a fun job. <laughs> like it has good parts of it to be sure, to be clear. But, you know, I think that there sometimes people imagine that like, you know, the CTO gets to be this like genius in the corner who like, comes up with brilliant strategies and, you know, everybody like hangs on their every word and they're the best engineer. And, and look, there are, I'm not going to claim that that person doesn't exist in the world. Um, and if you want to be that person, work on learning how to do like work on like learning how to make really great product and strategic decisions about technology, right? Just like learn that stuff, learn it really, really well. Um, and then go be a co-founder with somebody um, and you can have that job and you can have it for as long as they will tolerate you on however well you negotiate your contract on the way in. Lots of people like that end up getting fired or pushed off into a corner. And the person who's called VP or SVP of engineering is the person that's really running engineering. But, you know, they're the co-founder. They're still around. That's, you know, whatever. Like, that's fine. Um the, you know, most people who are, I think, successful CTOs, they are professional, you know, manager executives. They know a lot about business. They're very good at dealing with the whims of the CEO or the COO or both. Um, they're really good at recruiting and inspiring teams and, you know, making hard trade-offs about what should be done to keep, you know, the engineering team and the business partners all happy. And, you know, they're willing to go through extremely tedious meetings, extremely tedious budget processes, you know, selling the board on X, Y, or Z, right? It's, you know, it is, it is very much a, a challenging, stressful, uh, emotionally draining you know, job where you don't get a lot of thank yous and, you know, kudos and rewards. Like you mostly just, you know, you, you've just got to sit there and like, you know, 
make people happy, make everyone around you happy all the time. Um, and I think that that, you know, when people say they want to be a CTO, that's not what they're thinking of. But that is, in fact, what the job looks like at a lot of companies. Um, and, you know, so, if you, you know, if you're you're new to tech and you say you want to be a CTO, that's fine. Right. You know, keep working, keep growing, keep challenging yourself. You may change your mind in five years or 10 years or 20 years. Or you may say, no, I still really want to do this. And if you really want to do it, you can make it happen. But once you've made it happen, just I hope that you will be willing to say, OK, is this making me happy or not? Because if it's not making you happy, don't don't become so obsessed with titles that you you know neglect your own happiness in the process. I love one point that you made, and this is where the CTO is not just a technical person. And you've covered this in your book as well, but it's also a person that has a deep understanding of the business, because I feel like that is sometimes the misalignment where you think the CTO is the person that decides I will point you to an algo and we'll implement it this way or this way, right? It's not the necessarily chief architect, but it is the person that has a deep understanding of the technical stack, the business, and how it all comes together. Such yeah. an important point that I feel like, again, very important for folks to understand early on because it's not just about the, the allure of easy decision making. That people will come in to me and ask, well, which, you know, which framework do I choose? Is it this one or this one? And you point a finger, it's like, I'm a CTO, go with this. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> so you are a CTO Rent a Runway, and I want to learn more about that. How did you manage the stress? Because you called out that being a CTO is very stressful and a draining job. And how did you manage your management responsibilities? It's kind of managed management responsibilities, <laughs> but with avoiding burnout and just auto exhaustion as CTO, because you have to make a lot of decisions, you're growing the business, you're growing the team. How was that? You know, I, I won't claim that I did a perfect job of managing it. And in the moment, right, I, I worked really hard um, in a few different ways, right? I had a coach, actually I had multiple coaches um, at one point, um, who were helping me learn how to do the job. I had a CTO coach, and then just sort of a, a professional coach. Um, and so the CTO coach was really there to help me like know what it means to be a CTO and kind of, you know, give me feedback on, you know, a lot of the kind of details of running the team. And, you know, he was a really great kind of advisor on that. Realm. And then my professional coach was much more there to help me, you know, think about approaches to difficult relationships, think about how I was, you know, handling myself and my own stress and you know, growing effectively from all the things that I was learning without, you know, without burning it myself out. Um, and that was really helpful. And I definitely advise people in these kinds of situations, you know, coaching is useful. I also had a group of friends that were in similar situations as VPs of engineering or, or CTOs. And we would, you know, give each other advice and support and, you know, it's really useful to have other people that you know that are going through similar situations so that you can remember that, like, oh, yeah, like, this isn't just me. I'm not terrible at this job. Like, everybody struggles with these things. All right. That, that helps um, ground you, you know. And then, I mean, beyond that, it's like, look, like, you've got the normal, you know, things that people talk about. Get exercise, take vacations, meditate if it's your kind of thing, right? You know, all of those things which, which help. but well, at the end of the day, I think that being a CTO means that it's really hard to put the job down when you go home for the night or, you know, when you turn your computer off. Right. And so I didn't work like crazy, crazy hours. You wouldn't find me online, you know, 20 hours a day or anything like that. But I think, you know, towards the end, I did I did get a little burned out, but mostly because I was just thinking about work all the time that I just never was able to turn off thinking about what was going on at work, worrying about this thing or trying to, you know, find a solution for this other thing, whatever. And I think that was, that's one of the big challenges at being at that level of leadership is it's really hard to shut it off. Um, and I don't have a great answer for how to do that. Like, I don't, I don't know that I would be able to do that if I were in that situation today, right? You can certainly manage it by again, like exercise and getting enough sleep and taking vacations, those are all important things. Like taking care of yourself sort of physically and giving yourself breaks is really important. If you don't do that, you're going to be in, you know, really bad shape. But, it, you know, you at, at some point, especially when you're at a startup and it's very stressful, the, your life is your job. Um, and, you know, it's kind of just about like how much endurance do you have and how much are you getting out of it, um, given how much you're going to be putting in. 
I mean, like you said, it does come with the job because the business doesn't stop and certain decisions need to be made around the clock, whether it's your time zone, not your time zone. But in that regard, one of the things that is very important for managers is to be very crisp about the prioritization of their own time, their team's time. How do you tackle that problem? How do you define what is the right priority? Because I'm sure, again, as a CTO, you have a million things on your plate. They just and everything seems to be urgent. Everything seems to be, this is critical for the business. How do you decide what to tackle and which are the key areas? Some of it just starts to become instinct after a while. Like you can just sort of tell what's going to fall apart um, if you don't immediately do something about it. Um, I think that, look, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things you really have to force yourself to do as a CTO is make time for the important stuff that isn't urgent. Um, and make sure you invest time in that and thinking about the future and thinking about the strategy and thinking about, you know, what's going to break in six months if we don't attend to it. Um, you know, that is that is something that, um, you know, I, I actually have struggled with during this pandemic in my current job um, because, I you know, just the stress of the pandemic. It's just like, oh, I just want to like do my best I can and then like put my job away and like walk away. I haven't successfully done that really, but like, you know, you're sort of trying to do that. But I do think that it's good advice in general to make sure you're spending some time and kind of giving yourself, you know, a half a day a week where you don't have any meetings so that you can force yourself to think. Um, I definitely think that, look, your relationship with your peers and your relationship with your team is super important, right? Making time for one-on-ones, making time to talk to people and listen to them and, you know, nurture those relationships because you get things done through your team. Um, and so if you get so busy that you're neglecting, you know, your, your direct reports and you're, you're neglecting the managers that report to you, that's a bad, that's that all almost always ends up poorly because um, they will, you know, even the ones that you have the most trust with, you know, something happens, they don't have a chance to talk to you about it, it starts to fester, it turns into a whole situation. And losing your, you know, losing your managers who you trust, and they're doing good work, you know, all of a sudden, like you're in a really bad situation, right? So, so, you know, making sure you do not neglect that regular maintenance work of one on ones with your direct reports, making sure you do not neglect building and nurturing relationships with your peers, um, you know, the head of product or the head of, you know, uh, you know, the, the COO or, you know, whomever that you that you kind of work with in peer relationships, um, because those people also are, you know, the, you may need to band together to, to try to push back on the CEO who may have like a ridiculous request or, you know, to really get you know, your team gets in a bind because their team is asking for something that's not possible. And you need to be able to negotiate that effectively. Um, and so I think that those, you know, like making time to think about the future and nurturing your your ongoing relationships and then you know doing the best you can at learning how to delegate 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 you know hiring great people and giving them the chance to own stuff so that you don't have to own it getting stuff off of your plate is really the only way you're going to survive and scale and i think people who fail to effectively delegate um really tend to tend to crack under the pressure of of managing at larger scales so you mentioned one-on-ones and what does a good one-on-one look like? Because this is something that when you talk to managers, oftentimes when they have a lot of things on their agenda, this is the first thing to go because you know I have, I'm too busy for one-on-ones. There's a lot of things I need to do and this is just a meeting with my report. We'll do it later. Yeah. What's a good one-on-one look like? You know, so I'm a fan of like one-on-ones as very much a little bit choose your own adventure when it comes to my direct reports. Like I, and now this is a little bit of a function of me being at a very senior level and the people who report to me being fairly senior. But, mm-hmm. you know, so I I think a good one-on-one happens regularly, right? You don't bounce it around. You try to keep it in the same time slot as much as possible. And you, you definitely try not to cancel it unless it's really, you know, look, we all go on vacation sometimes. That's fine, right? But you want to, you want to avoid canceling it. You want to have them happen. And the most important thing is you, that you honor the time and you sit down with them and just give them the space to bring things up that they think that they may need to talk about. If you don't reserve the space, then small things will build up. They won't get talked about because here's what happens, right? 
like, oh, I was really annoyed with what you said in that meeting to me. Um, if we had our one-on-one, I would bring it up. But our one-on-one got canceled. And now it's just been like three weeks since we talked. And it just feels like I'm holding a grudge to bring this up to you now. Right? So there are so many things that are like that. And expecting your direct reports to just grab you asynchronously and tell you that stuff. It's like, look, maybe some of them will do that. But you cannot bank on them having the courage to do that. You need to make sure you're honoring their space. Um, I think that one-on-ones, you know, with different people are going to have different, uh, you know, different cadences, right? So some people, when you're having one-on-ones with more junior people, you may talk about career more often, for example, right? They're earlier in their career. They probably, they might care a lot about getting promoted. They want to be challenged. They want to hear about, they want to get feedback a lot. They want to hear about what they could be working on, right? You know, at more senior levels, you still talk about career some, but you may talk about career a few times a year. You may spend a lot more time talking about, frankly, like what's going on. If you have somebody reporting to you who's managing 40 people or 400 people or whatever, um, you're like, you're not just going to read written status reports from that person to know what's going on. That That is an unrealistic expectation. What What's going to happen is they're going to bring the stuff that has some nuance to you. And you're going to talk about the nuance that wouldn't make it in a status report. And that's important. That's important stuff to knowing how to operate your business, right? Um, you know, you might talk about who on their team should be promoted, right? So that's a good use of one-on-ones. Also talking about the people that are on their team that are having trouble or who are doing really great, right? Um, you might talk about, you know, just simply sharing some information about what's going on in the business, making connections, saying, hey, I think you should really make some time to talk to these people in this team because they're working on a similar project and I want to make sure we've got those overlaps, right? So one-on-ones can look like a lot of different things, right? I have people who have one-on-ones with me who always come with a written agenda that they share ahead of time and we always go through their agenda and that that works well for them. Um, I have people who they may very well have a written agenda, but they don't share it with me. That's fine with me, right? Like I, you know, again, at this level, I feel like it's choose your own adventure. But the most important thing is that you have them, you have real conversations in them. Um, you, you know, you, you actually are trying to engage with this person on meaningful topics, right? So it shouldn't just be a like, check, check, check status report, but you want to, you know, you want to be able to have a little bit of a back and forth in a conversation. Um, and you know, you're, you're covering topics that are important to them, but not neglecting topics that are important to you. And in your career and experience, have you found a way in which you can foster those candid conversations? Because coming to one-on-ones with, I don't want to say the problems, because you don't want to come into a one-on-one and just complaining about everything constantly. But having a candid conversation of saying, like the example you called out, where you said something to me in the meeting, it didn't sit well with me. How can we go about solving this? Is there an approach that worked well in your experience to have those conversations with your reports? Because as a manager, there is the weight of you're the person that fires and hires. So, you know, you, you can't just quiet back in your manager in a meeting and say, hey, you suck at your job or something like that. How do you approach that? So um, I think that when it comes to having those conversations with your manager, I mean, look, there's no there's nothing easy here. I, I have these conversations with my various managers, you know, in, in my career, and it's always terrifying. So. Uh, I don't, I do not have like a magic wand to make these conversations less terrifying. I have, I have, um, you know, at, at a senior enough level though, there, there is a, there is wisdom to looking at your relationship with your manager. And again, this is probably not appropriate if you're like straight out of college, but this is appropriate. Certainly at the level I'm at reporting to a CTO, you know, at, at a certain very senior level where you say, you know what? Part of, like part of my job is to make this person, you know, happy, but not in like a, you know, yes man kind of way. I want them to be happy. I want them to be motivated and engaged. And when you're when you are a manager yourself, that's hopefully the way you approach managing your own people, right? Like this is where people who think that management is all about telling people what to do are wrong, right? Like like management very often is somebody who reports to you wants to do a thing. And you may in the back of your mind think it is a terrible idea. But nine times out of 10, you are not going to say that is a terrible idea. Do not do that. You're going to say, 
okay, like here's, here are some thoughts that I have about this. Here's what I'd like to, maybe here's what I'd like to see if you're going to proceed with this. Like, you know, here's my advice. Here's my guidance. Okay. Like I want you to like you, if you are set on this thing that you want to do, I'm going to think very, very carefully about whether I want to like pull it from you or not. Right. Whether I want to say no. And so I think similarly, when you're talking to your own boss at this, at this very senior most level, you want to give, if you have to have a hard conversation with them, almost like flipping that power, power arrangement in your own mind and thinking like, how would I have this conversation if this person reported to me? Now, you're not going to say to them like, that was unacceptable. You should never speak that way in my meetings. Cause of course, like they're not, they don't report to you, but you know, you might say, look like, you know, how do you like that had this impact on me? I didn't, you know, I, you know, I, I, I would prefer that we not interact that way. Like, how can we move forward, you know, with this? Um, Or if your boss has made a decision that you don't agree with, like, look, like, you know, I, I think that we should really think about X, Y, and Z. I'm nervous about the consequences of this. I will support you in whatever you end up deciding but here's my feedback on why I disagree with this decision, whether you say disagree with this decision or not. And again, I don't think this is advice that if you are listening to this podcast and you are early in your career, I'm not sure this advice makes any sense for you at all, but there will maybe come a time when you are at a senior most level where looking at your boss and remembering that you have a lot of power in that relationship um, can actually help you have hard conversations because you can almost like go in them, go, go, go at them from a seat of your own sort of, you know, your own power a little bit. So embrace the, I'd say like power imbalance in a positive way that steers it. Yeah. Towards your, yeah. Don't feel like a victim. <laughs> right. Right. And this is where a lot of teams. And I think the best managers that I've had, were always fostering this. We're in this together to solve a business problem. Let's iterate and share ideas and thoughts. This is not personal. This is about the business. And it doesn't mean you have to be a jerk, but you approach this in a way that it's okay to get feedback because sometimes, and feedback is scary. It's scary to go tell somebody that I actually didn't agree with what you did and this backfired and look at where we are now. But I know we're getting to the top of the hour and I want to ask one final question. And that is through your entire career, if you would give the advice to somebody that wants to follow in your footsteps, what would that advice be? What do you tell them? Maybe it's the biggest takeaway that you learned throughout the years of doing engineering leadership and deep engineering work. So the advice I would give would be to aggressively seek out um, lots of, of information about about sort of the ways that people approach problems. Um, you know, be, be kind of relentless in learning about, uh, about complex situations and how they resolve. Um, because, you know, I think, I, I do think that, that, you know, becoming like, look, being a great, you know, distributed systems engineer or being a great leader in engineering all you're ever dealing with is very complex systems that have lots of things that can go wrong, um, that have lots of different ways that they can behave, and where there's like very rarely one right answer. Um, and so, and and there are a lot of wise people that have made decisions out there that are similar to this that you can learn from. But you shouldn't necessarily just like blindly follow them, um, but. You know, I, I think that like one of the best things that I've done for my career has been to just aggressively learn from other people. Um, and, you know, I'm very curious about like the way things work in other companies. I'm very curious about the way different kinds of systems approach solving different kinds of problems. And I do think that that kind of drive to just like when I see something that I don't understand, like why would you ever approach solving that problem? Why would you ever structure your team that way? Why would you ever? you know, set goals that way. I want to understand it. And I may or may not agree with what I learned. Um, but I'm, I'm really like willing to ask a lot of questions when I don't understand things, um, and get a lot and get a lot of clarity so that I can make the best kind of mental model about what's going on so that, that I can make kind of better decisions. Um, you know, I, I just, I think that it's really hard 
Um, I think it's really hard to do the job that I do if you're not willing to um, ask other people for help. And if you're not willing to learn from lots and lots of other people and like, not just look, like it's not just learn from Google, although learn from Google, right? It's not just like learn from the best CEOs in the world, but learn from them, but also like learn from your friend at the tiny startup, right? Like learn from the college hire that you just made who like happens you know, to have a really interesting way of looking at this particular technical problem that's that's happening. You know, one of my, you know, one of my employees, like I have plenty of like, you know, early career employees who have said things to me in meetings that I've been like, yes, like that is, that's the metaphor for that team. Like that's the, that's why this system is so challenging to work on. You can learn stuff like from everywhere around you. And you know, that again, it doesn't mean you have to buy it. It doesn't mean you have to believe it, right? You can learn it and be like, there are so many flaws in that, that, you know, all right, glad I know that moving on from that. Um, But you've got to remain kind of open to adding additional evidence and asking questions. And this is not, you know, about tech, about leadership, about people, about companies, about, you know, business decision, about everything. Um, You know, the minute that you stop having that drive to, figure out new ways to approach problems and better ways to do things and learning from others. Um, I think it's kind of the minute that you sort of calcify and, and start to kind of lose your edge. And I love the insight that you provided that the, the good knowledge and thoughts and ideas can come from anywhere where a lot of folks often think like, well, my title is not high enough to go to tell this VP that there's a flaw in the system. No, they, they probably want to know just as much as you, everything that you know, tell them, it's one of those things where it's, I want to say like equalize in terms of knowledge transfer, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Camille, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. For people that want to learn more about what you're working on, where should they go online? Uh, yeah, probably the easiest thing to do is to follow me on Twitter. It's at Scamille, S-K-A-M-I-L-L-E. Um, I, you know, I tweet sort of on and off, but I do tweet. I also blog um, you, I have a, mo, po, I post most things on medium, um, with the same username, uh, and I have a, a website, um, with my blog as well, which is alightedbranches.com. but probably easiest to just follow me on Twitter or, you know, follow me on medium if you want to see my writing. Um, yeah. And that's, that's probably the easiest way to, to keep in touch. Wonderful. Camille, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you.